Star will mark the 20th anniversary of the attacks on September 11, 2001. How a local high school is honoring those that lost their lives in the attack and teaching its importance to those who weren't alive to see it. A local nonprofit's plan to honor first responders and military personnel. A look at Legacy Farmstead's Patriot Picnic. The traffic's are starting to heat up. We're going to keep an eye on the Gulf of Mexico. And what does that mean for our rain chances next week? We've got the latest coming up. Live from Case at 12, the news at noon starts right now. We are learning a bit more about a man who was shot and killed early this morning at an apartment complex on the southwest side. The Bear County Medical Examiner identifying him as 45-year-old Ricardo Perez. The murder happened in the 2500 block of South General McMullen. As Katrina Weber reports, police say Perez was shot as he walked through the complex's parking lot. Deadly actions on the part of someone with a gun arose from angry words, according to San Antonio police. When it was over, a 45-year-old man identified as Ricardo Perez was dead. Police say Perez was with a woman leaving a relative's home at the Winston Square Apartments just before 3 this morning when two other men approached them. They say they argued, then one of the other men shot Perez, fatally wounding him. In reaction, emotions ran over among his family, according to police, and they say they had to arrest two relatives for interfering with their work. Investigators searched the area in the 2500 block of South General McMullen for clues and later had an SUV towed away that they say somehow was related to the case. They say finding answers wasn't quite as easy. Police say they are starting at square one with this investigation. They say there's still a lot they don't know, including why this man was shot or whether he knew his killer. Reporting from Public Safety Headquarters, Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. And San Antonio police say a man is dead and a woman is in the hospital after a drive-by shooting on the city's east side. The shooting happened just before 9 last night near Gibbs and North New Braunfels Avenue. Police say someone drove up to the 40-year-old man and 34-year-old woman and shot him multiple times. EMS crews took the victims to the hospital where the man was pronounced dead. Police say the woman is stable at this time. SAPD says witnesses were not cooperative and officers are now looking through surveillance video to understand exactly what happened. A standoff between authorities and an armed woman inside Pleasanton City Hall has resolved peacefully. That's according to the Pleasanton Police Chief Ronald Sanchez. The situation began just after noon yesterday. Police say the woman had a weapon when she went inside City Hall and then into council chambers. At around 930 last night, Chief Sanchez confirmed the standoff had ended peacefully. The woman was taken to an area hospital. Police say no injuries were reported and no employees were in any danger. City Hall was closed off, as was Chapman Road, for several hours during that standoff. It has been 7,304 days since the September 11th attacks that took America by surprise. It's been 20 years, and today memorials and commemorations have already begun to take place in honor of the men and women who lost their lives that horrific morning. For many of us, it's a day that's impossible to forget. In fact, we often remember where we were and what we were doing when we learned those events were intentional. Since then, new generations of Americans have only known of these tragic events through documentaries and textbooks. Our Jonathan Cotto tells us why Piper High School officials, along with local fire departments, have now put together a stair climb. It's a grueling, physical way to honor the sacrifice firefighters made. Step after step, and breath after breath, Alberti firefighters, along with Piper High School students and community members, honored the lives of emergency workers and first responders who lost their lives in the September 11th attacks 20 years ago. Fire Chief Jerry Bialik with the Bulverde Fire Department says it's important the younger generations understand the bravery of those men and women that made their way up and through the World Trade Centers in New York City that horrific morning. It's really important that we keep this alive, that we remember what happened on that day, to bring it to these young 
kids, these high school students, and even my firefighters were probably very young, you know, or if live when, when, the, when the event happened. Rosie Jarvis, a participant in the memorial stair climb, says the climb was a lot harder than she expected. She says she has a new appreciation towards firefighters. Every 9-11, I, I have those memories of how grateful I am for the freedoms that we enjoy, but also for the sacrifices that were made to preserve lives and protect our country. Over 2,000 victims lost their lives in the September 11th attacks. 412 were emergency workers in New York City who responded to the World Trade Centers that morning. That also includes 343 firefighters. Today, Bull Verde firefighters say they understand the sacrifice they made, and the new generation of high school students say it's important to never forget. Firefighters at the memorial climb were facing visible exhaustion and say this experience only solidifies what they already imagined those brave men and women experienced. It's a grind, but not stopping. Jonathan Cotto, KSAT 12 News. Members of the community, Piper High School students and Bulverde firefighters climbed exactly 110 stairs, the same number of stairs the brave heroes took on on 9-11. Fire Chief Blaylock says the simulation is symbolic and very important. It's a tradition to keep alive. Although 20 years later, the images of the turmoil and pain that followed the 9-11 attack still sit with, us, sit with us today. For first responders, those who shed blood and tears overseas and their families, this anniversary may be even harder in order to provide some community hope. A nonprofit in Bernie has organized an event to honor those heroes. Alicia Barrera visited Legacy Farmstead in Bernie and has more on this patriotic event. Legacy Farmstead is an equine therapy nonprofit. It's run by John and Amy Henderson over in Bernie. And this weekend, they want to open up their doors for a community picnic. This Sunday, they'll honor the heroes from 9-11 with a special dedication to the 13 U.S. troops killed just days before America's longest war ended. A table will be preserved to honor the brave Americans. They want to remind active and retired first responders or military that there is a community behind them and that they are not alone. A lot of them signed up on 9-11. A lot of them, that was their motivation, you know, for, for signing the dotted line and for going into the military. And so this, uh, this, this day uh, and this, this weekend is, is, is more than uh, just an event that happened for them. It was really a change in their life and it was a change in their legacy. And so uh, I think that's important to remember that it's uh, even though the day and the years grow, uh, it was definitely a huge shift. In, in our culture and in a lot of the lives of these individuals that we, we hope to serve. The event is free. It's happening from 3 to 9 p.m. All the details are listed on KSAT.com, including a link to RSVP. Reporting Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. Happening right now on KSAT.com, a special presentation of KSAT Explains. Our team gives us a look at what happened on September 11th, 2001, 20 years later through the eyes of the responders who were there. You can listen to the stories of the first responders and military personnel from that fateful day as they explain how the events of 9-11 changed their lives and changed America forever. That's available right now. It's on our website, kset.com or any way you stream. And mark your calendars for two o'clock this coming Monday. I'm going to be hosting our first New You virtual town hall. We have a panel of experts joining us to talk about everything health and wellness from fitness and nutrition to mental health and self-care. Head to our website and look for this article to send your questions for our panelists. Then tune in Monday on KSAT.com and KSAT TV streaming app to get your question answered. This will kick off a segment that you might remember right here on the News at Noon. So stay tuned for that as well. Are you ready to follow the White Rabbit? Mr. Anderson returns to the Matrix later on this year. We've got a look at the Matrix resurrection coming up in the spotlight. And if there is such a thing as a moral victory, the Cowboys are 1-0. However, the stat sheet says otherwise. Larry Mears with the comeback of Dak Prescott and the Cowboys opening night highlights on the way. And a major highway seeing some major problems. After the break, traffic authority Stephen Cavazos gives us a look at what's happening on I-35 and how Schertz police Plan to fix it. A 
It is a major highway with countless drivers taking it every day, but I-35 could also be a spot for major problems. According to the Church Police Department, since January of this year, there have been hundreds of crashes already reported along the corridor. Your traffic authority, Steve McVossilis, tells us how they're tackling those problems. If you've driven to Austin or San Antonio, it's likely you've encountered a traffic delay on I-35, but a minor problem can easily turn into a traffic nightmare. Speeding, people being impatient and cutting other people off in traffic lanes. Um, instead of staying in a traffic lane and just riding it out, they want to switch lanes back and forth. Officer Anna Kraft with the Search PD says it's a recipe for headaches and at times even danger. One of the most active times for problems, the morning and afternoon rush hour. Since the start of this year, Search PD has responded to 749 crashes along the I-35 corridor. Now our dispatch gets inundated with phone calls asking what's going on. Kraft says one of the main causes is distracted driving, but that's the reason why Search PD provides traffic alerts on their social media pages, warning drivers of what's ahead before they encounter it. We hopefully knock out some of the accidents, but I don't know. We got a lot of people on the road, so hopefully we reach a lot of people. SPD also shares traffic tips to drivers to help them understand how to handle different traffic situations. Kraft says the goal is to keep drivers informed and educated. We feel like if we break it down in simple terms, it can help people understand it. She hopes these traffic alerts will make the roadways a little bit easier to navigate, but more importantly, safer. Stephen Cavasso's KSAT 12 News. And Church police also want to remind drivers to move over and slow down for first responders when they are working to clear crash scenes. All right, the big question, who got a little exercise this morning? It was actually almost chilly today, Justin. Yes, that's what I said earlier when I was taking out my recycling bin earlier, before sunrise, before work. Is that your exercise? It was, that little walk there. Uh, it, it was, it was <laughs> almost chilly in my opinion. It was cool. We had some places in the 50s this morning. Uh, the aquifer is down two tenths of a foot today to 659.6. Looking at the pollen count, molds jumped up for whatever reason, 1640. Ragweed, pigweed also both there. We're watching the Gulf of Mexico. We could get some rain out of a tropical system. We'll talk about it coming up. Okay, so Justin, Brought in the recycling bin. That was his exercise in this gorgeous weather. What mm -hmm. was yours? This morning? Mm-hmm. I actually walked out into the driveway and went, oh, it's nice out here. And then I walked and got in my truck. That was it. <laughs> That's all I had. What was that, 10 feet? You only about got about 7,000 more to go. Mm. It was nice, work. Y'all got to enjoy this weather while we have it. Come on. Yeah, well, you know, it's early. <laughs> Did you need a You said chilly a while ago. Did you I, like it? Almost was. I, you know, that that's my take on it. Well, I don't know you, that everyone you get would agree with that when it's yeah. 85. Justin and I are the ones who are always yeah. cold in the newsroom, so it was cold this morning yeah, it, in it our was. thermostat. It was in the 50s in some spots, and to me, that 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 registers as pretty chilly. Uh, before we look at those morning lows, uh, you may have noticed a little bit of haze in the atmosphere today. At least I, I noticed it a little bit earlier. Looks like we are getting a little bit of smoke. Coming in from the west, of course, they've had all those wildfires there and with the ridge pipe pressure pushing everything from the west and then uh, pushing everything down south into Texas. There is a little bit of smoke out there. It looks like we're picking up on some of that. It's it's light, not a big problem, but I just want to make you aware there that we do have a little bit of a haze to the atmosphere at this hour. Lows this morning, as I mentioned, 67 here in San Antonio, but 57 Bernie Stage, 56 in Kerrville. Fantastic weather, 64 Rock Springs, Del Rio only got down to 71, but that's better than what they have been seeing. A lot of places were in the 60s this morning. Now, things have changed, obviously, pretty quickly here. 87 now at the airport, 89 Stinson and 86 at Kelly. Not a lot of wind today, less of a breeze than yesterday. And temperatures in the mid-80s for the most part. There are a few 90s starting to show up, places like Divine and Pleasanton checking in at 90 or a little bit above 93 Katua, 87 in Kennedy, 88 in Gonzales. Forecast for the rest of today takes us up to about 97. We'll see an east northeasterly breeze at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Should be great for football this evening. So we've got the dry air in place. It's going to be very dry, dry the rest of today and tomorrow. 
And then on Sunday, you'll notice it. The humidity is going to start to come back and it'll happen very quickly by the late afternoon and the evening hours. Dew points will be right back into the 60s on Sunday and then we keep the humidity all next week. In fact, it uh, even grows a little bit. We'll see those dew points get up near 70. The air across Texas is fairly dry. Lots of 40s and 50s, at least across North Texas. Now, as you get into deep South Texas, dew points are in the 70s down there, so it's a little more humid. But we've been enjoying uh, this low humidity courtesy of our ridge of high pressure, which is centered out west. This is a big area of high pressure. I mentioned some of that smoke getting pulled around that ridge here in the South Texas. It's also bringing in the drier air. Meantime, in the tropics, things are getting more active. We've been talking about this tropical wave that could potentially bring us some tropical moisture early next week. Uh, Hurricane Center now thinks there's about a 70% chance of development with this. And as we know, anything that gets into the Gulf of Mexico can often develop pretty quickly. I don't think there's a lot of real estate for that to happen here, but there is that chance that we could be looking at maybe a tropical depression by early next week. What does that mean for us? I, I think if we're looking at that, it's probably going to be just some tropical moisture. And it really depends on the track of that system, where it develops and where it goes. I think it stays weak, but if it tracks a little bit to our east, we're going to be on the dry side of things. If it goes a little bit further west, we could get some decent rain out of it. So as of right now, we're going to put in a 40% chance of rain there Monday, 30% chance on Tuesday. With some question marks, we're going to have to wait a little bit longer, see exactly where this thing moves. Uh, but the bottom line, rain, if it, if that's going to be the main issue with this system. And whether or not we get it, uh, still a few questions here. We'll keep you posted. Otherwise, temperatures will be hot next couple days, guys. All right, Justin, thank you. We mentioned a second ago, moral victory. Yay, woo! <laughs> not so much. Stat sheet. Nah. Yeah. I'll tell, one. I'll tell you, yeah, you're right. Uh, Dak Prescott, though, yeah. outplayed Tom Brady last night. He did. His numbers were better. So Dak's Ooh. leg and his bad right throwing shoulder that cost him the preseason both are looking pretty darn good he shined in his return plus texans quarterback tyrod taylor is talking expectations coming up no I've, i didn't plan on throwing it that many times and no i never questioned my health or um, being able to throw it 50 times or um, how i'd feel out there Dak Prescott threw a whopping 58 passes last night in the Cowboys' season-opening loss in Big Board Sports. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Tom Brady and the Buccaneers entered as eight-and-a-half-point favorites against the Cowboys last night, but Dak Prescott, playing in his first game in 11 months, kept it closer than that. Third quarter, Dak drops back, throws into a crowd, and the ball is intercepted by Carlton Davis, Dak's lone pick last night. Davis returns it 31 yards to the Cowboys' 19, and Tampa Bay is in business. Four plays later, Brady finds Rob Gronkowski for an 11-yard touchdown, his second of the game. Gronk spike, of course, and the Bucks lead 28-19. But Dak brings his guys back. Late third, he goes over the top to Amari Cooper in the end zone. Touchdown, and the boys are down 28-26. Coop with 139 yards receiving and two touchdowns. Fourth quarter, Cowboys ball after they created a turnover, stopping the Bucks inside the red zone. Dak connects with CeeDee Lamb, and he gets 31 yards down to the Bucks 34, a key third down play. Five plays after that, bring on Greg Zerline for a 48-yarder, and it's good, and the boys lead 29 at 28. Greg DeLeg had a tough night, though, missing two field goals and an extra point. But leaving 130 on the clock was more than enough time for Tom Brady to work his magic. Enter Ryan Suckup. Not much longer after that play to cap off an 11 play, 57 yard drive. He's good from 36 yards with seven seconds left, and that's your ball game. Bucks beat the boys 31 29. Dak throwing 58 times for 403 yards with three touchdowns. Dak looking good, but losing stinks. I um, mean, we came up short, uh, bottom line. Um, obviously, uh, we, we fought hard. We fought all the way to there in the end. That's a good football team that we're playing. Um, they, they got us by a field goal right there. We've got to be better situationally um, in the red zone. Um, defense did a great job giving us chances when we uh, didn't convert touchdowns or field goals and getting us the ball right back. Uh, they did an incredible job, and um, we'll get better because of this one. Obviously, it was tough. Um, tough anytime you don't you don't win, as I said, it's the expectations for, um, for this team, for myself, and uh, yeah. 
Ezekiel Elliott was held in check, rushing for 33 yards on 11 carries with a long of 13. He certainly didn't eat well last night. Sunday afternoon, the Tyrod Taylor era will officially kick off for the Houston Texans. Head coach David Coley publicly announced Taylor as a starter Monday. QB Deshaun Watson, who's dealing with legal issues, is still on the 53-man roster, but is expected to be a healthy scratch on game days. Tyrod was asked about his expectations. I expect, I mean, obviously from myself to go out and, and, and play uh, winning football. And I think the same for the team. I think the expectation is the same. Uh, winning football is the standard. Uh, we've set that standard from day one with the work that we put in uh, day in and day out. And uh, like I said, it's going to boil down to executing and doing that at a high level. Texans starting right offensive tackle Charlie Heck is out after testing positive for COVID-19. Kick is noon Sunday at NRG Stadium against the Jaguars. But the Cowboys did answer two questions though. Dak looks healthy. Yep. And their defense looks a lot better. It looks a year. lot better. So as long as they keep getting better throughout the season, it'll be good. All right, Larry, thanks. Will you choose the red pill or the blue pill? Kanani Reeves makes his way back into the matrix. We've got a first look for you coming up in the spotlight. And President Joe Biden has laid out his plan to end the coronavirus pandemic. After the break, how he plans to change the minds of the nation's roughly 80 million unvaccinated citizens. Now to the coronavirus emergency and President Biden's new plan to turn the tide on the pandemic. The president pushing sweeping new vaccine mandates that will affect about 100 million workers. ABC's Alex Boucher explains what we know about the mandates so far. President Biden following up on his plan to fight the devastating Delta variant. He and the first lady touring a school with the secretary of education. The safest thing you can do for your child 12 and over is get them vaccinated. And for students here at Brooklyn, once you all get vaccinated, you're invited to a special visit at the White House. <laughs> There's a record number of COVID infections among children. Victims increasingly young. 15-year-old Victoria Ramirez of Florida died of COVID complications. She and her family hadn't gotten the shot. The Los Angeles County School District Thursday becoming the first in the country to mandate vaccines in students 12 and older. Across the U.S., nearly 102,000 patients hospitalized, four times higher than the rate a year ago. The daily death rate, over 1,000. The president clearly frustrated taking aim at the nation's 80 million unvaccinated Americans. We've been patient. But our patience is wearing thin, and your refusal has cost all of us. Now, President Biden's announcing the most sweeping COVID requirements yet, rolling out a plan that will affect 100 million Americans, ordering all businesses with more than 100 workers to either require employees to be vaccinated or get tested weekly. That vaccine mandate now also required for 17 million health care workers, plus 4 million federal government employees and contractors who won't have the option to get weekly tests. Biden also focused on schools, calling on governors to require vaccinations for teachers and staff and taking aim at what he calls pandemic politics from leaders who not only discourage masks and vaccines, but some who outright ban mandates. The president's plan already drawing fire from opponents. 19 Republican governors are slamming Biden's call for vaccine mandates, calling them a federal overreach. Alex Perche, ABC News, Washington. And because of the Delta variant, Microsoft is scrapping its plans to fully reopen its U.S. offices. It had planned to fully reopen its headquarters in many offices all across the country as early as October 4th. But given the uncertainty of COVID-19, the tech giant has indefinitely abandoned that plan and won't set a new reopening date just yet. Microsoft joins a growing list of major companies forced to delay their back to office plans. Amazon, Facebook, other tech companies have said they won't be back in the office until 2022 at the earliest. Big headlines today. President Joe Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping say they're working to find some common ground. The two spoke on the phone yesterday amid tensions between the two countries. The White House says Biden talked about the nation's competitive relationship and addressed cybersecurity concerns. According to Chinese state media, Jing said U.S. policies have been causing difficulties. He suggested the countries work together for their mutual benefit. 
The Lebanese presidency says that a new government has now been formed. This breaking the 13 month deadlock that launched the country into financial chaos. Now, Lebanon has been without a fully empowered government ever since that huge explosion that happened last August at the Beirut port, which forced the resignation of the prime minister. Since the explosion, rival political groups have been fighting over the makings of a new government in Lebanon, only speeding up the nation's economic meltdown. The new government is led by a billionaire, and it was signed into effect earlier this month. Outside with live cam, we hadn't even hit 90 yet. What does that mean? Justin used the word chilly for this morning. So how long will those chilly mornings last? We've got one more morning. One more morning of that. Uh, and, you know, it was cool enough this morning where, you know, we haven't made it to 90 yet. I, I don't think we make it up to 100 today. We'll be just below that mark with some more dry heat. And, of course, we got more Friday Night Football games tonight. Let's look at the forecast. And this may surprise David, but the field goal is going to be good yet again. Wow. It's <laughs> didn't see there. It's every time. Wow. 93 kickoff, 85 halftime. Clear skies tonight should be really good for watching some football. 84 Bulverde, 84 Seguin, 87 in Gonzales, 90 in Pleasanton, 87 uh, out in Uvalde with clear skies there. Rain chances this week, just a 40% chance uh, there on Monday as we get some tropical moisture in here. And again, we're watching what's going on there in the Gulf of Mexico. Depending on the track of that system, we could be in for more rain. Or we may be on the dry side of things. There's still some questions there. And again, we'll. Uh, dive into that uh, issue coming up here in just a few minutes. We'll look a little closer at the forecast. 97 today, northeasterly winds 5 to 10 miles per hour. And look for clear skies tonight falling down to 82 at 10 o'clock. Guys. Thank you, Justin. In your health headlines today, companies test drugs worldwide, but some countries may not even get to use the drugs they test for years. With more, here's ABC's Elizabeth Schulze in today's Medical Minutes. Drug approval is a complicated process that involves a lot of time and money for pharmaceutical companies. Many of the latest drugs are first tested in countries around the world. Researchers from Yale University looked at what happens to these drugs once they complete testing. They studied 34 drugs that were tested across 70 different countries. What they found was surprising. Only 15% of these drugs ended up being approved in all 70 countries. Approvals were faster for richer countries in Europe and Canada. Meantime, African countries didn't get many of these drugs even five years after the U.S. FDA had already approved them. Researchers say that companies should help countries get access to the drugs they test. They acknowledge the process may be expensive, but that research must benefit everyone, especially those who do the hard work of testing these drugs. With this Medical Minute, I'm Elizabeth Schulze, ABC News. No one can explain what the Matrix is. <laughs> you have to see it for yourself. We're going to give you a look at the long-awaited sequel. I didn't understand the first two. It's coming up in the spotlight. The UTSA Roadrunners are going to be led by a local former high school star going into a huge weekend for the runners. Larry Ramirez with that coming up. Burger King letting celebrities make it their way. A look at the fast food chain's new celebrity meals coming up in your consumer news. This is your daily tech and business briefing from Cheddar News. GameStop already on the rebound, not after plummeting 10% earlier this week. The shares finished slightly higher after the bell Thursday. That after the company reported a beat on the top line, but earnings came in short of estimates. But the big news, everybody talking about that bizarre earnings call afterwards. The newly appointed CEO spoke for just eight minutes and refused questions from investors. The company's CFO was not on the call either, and the retailer did not provide an outlook for future quarters. Meanwhile, if you want to purchase a new TV, you might want to hold on a bit because Amazon officially getting into the TV business. The company will be releasing their first ever TVs next month. There'll be two versions, the Amazon Fire TV Omni Series and the Amazon Fire TV 4 Series. Now, each version will be available in a range of sizes and prices from $370 to $1,100. And e-retailer Packable Plans going public soon via a SPAC. The parent company of PharmaPacks, the top seller on Amazon.
Amazon's third-party marketplace and is the latest seller to go public via SPAC. The merger with Highland Transcend Partners One Corp will value the combined company at $1.55 billion. And that's your Cheddar News Business and Tech Update. I'm Baker Machado coming to you from Cheddar Studios in Lower Manhattan. In more consumer news this noon, Burger King using celebrities with stage names to promote its food changes. The company is also banning 120 artificial ingredients. The new keep it real meals like this one emphasize what Burger King calls real food. Singer songwriter Chase Hudson, better known as Lil Huddy, was, has created a meal that includes a spicy chicken sandwich, mozzarella sticks and a shake. Musicians Nelly and Anita have their own meals as well. Burger King says its food will taste the same, so customers wouldn't notice the changes on their own. McDonald's, Panera, and Taco Bell also moving away from artificial ingredients. In fact, McDonald's is running almost the same can of, kind, of pan, can, can, kind of campaign. A what kind of campaign? Celebrities are telling their meals. Actress Jennifer Lawrence is expecting. Lucifer says goodbye to a fan favorite and Keanu Reeves jumps back into the world of the Matrix. There's a lot going on in Hollywood. AB, rather, CNN's Rick Damagella is gonna give us a look. If you want the truth, Neo, you're going to have to fly me. Neo is back. This is your first look at Keanu Reeves in the upcoming sequel, The Matrix Resurrections. The actor is joined by Carrie Ann Moss for another eye-popping visual feast in the fourth film of the hit sci-fi franchise, which arrives December 22nd. No offense, Decker, but I'd snap you like a twig. It's the end of the road for the stars of Lucifer. The final episodes of the hit series dropped on Netflix Friday, and star Leslie Ann Brandt explains how she feels saying goodbye after six seasons. I think there's this theme of bitter sweetness, you know, um, sort of sitting in really deep gratitude for having had a show air for six years and coming back from, you know, the dead after we got uh, saved and brought back to Netflix. <laughs> Jennifer Lawrence is pregnant. The Oscar-winning star is expecting a baby with her art dealer husband, Cook Maroney. This is the first child for the notoriously private pair who wed in 2019. In Hollywood, I'm Rick Damagella. Outside again with Live Game. Oh, up to 89. Oh, it's no. going to be an odd one. <laughs> hey, and what is the widest jump we've ever gone from morning to the high? You know, if the air is really dry, sometimes it can almost get up to a 40 degree spread, but that's pretty rare. We, we, we had about a 30 something degree spread yesterday, so that day, it tells you the air is extremely dry. 67 was the low this morning. I think we'll be up into the upper 90s today, so about 30 degrees between the high and low. The averages are 91 and 71, records are 101 and 57. Set back in 1893 and just last year, 2020, we'll talk about the tropics, which are starting to heat up coming up. So I guess you got one more day to get up early and enjoy some cool weather. One more day. That's more all day. I get. That's all you get. Just one. I'm just going to get up and mow tomorrow. It's going to be the perfect. <laughs> there you go. Now you, now you can't put it off another day. No, 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 it's got to be, it's got to be tomorrow. <laughs> uh, the humidity does come back on Sunday and then maybe just maybe a little bit of rain next week. So it'd be a good time to get out and, and mow the lawn this weekend. Uh, let's go outside for you right now. We've got a couple clouds here in the distance. So uh, we may see a few clouds from time to time today, but not many. 87, your current reading dew point is at 61. Numbers a little higher than it was yesterday. I still think we dropped down into the 50s for dew points this afternoon, so it'll still feel fairly dry out there. Uh, the satellite picture shows some of those clouds we were seeing in the distance. Just some fair weather cumulus clouds, no big deal. 84 Seguin, 87 New Braunfels. Clear skies if you're in Hondo, 87 there. 90 already in Carrizo Springs. And you can see where some of those clouds are setting up, roughly from LaGrange down towards Corpus Christi and Catula and just to the east of San Antonio. Dew points are in the 60s and they're higher where we're seeing some of those clouds. Dew points in the 60s, maybe even 70s. As you go north and northwest, those dew points drop off into the 50s, and that's what allowed temperatures to fall into the 50s this morning in parts of the hill country. We'll make it up to about 97 today. That's where we were yesterday. We'll call it sunny, although again, a cloud or two may pop up. Dew point tracker, dew points will stay low today and tomorrow. It's not until Sunday morning that we see an increase in humidity, and it will happen pretty quickly 
And by the time we get into Sunday evening, it turns humid again and stays humid all next week. So the reprieve from the heat index and uh, all that stickiness is uh, going to be short lived. You look at what the weather pattern looks like here and it's, it's high pressure that is in control. It's a big one. It'll start to break down some and the weather pattern is uh, going to be interesting. I think as we get into early next week, there's still a lot of questions here as to what's going on in the tropics or what will happen in the tropics. This is what we know is that there is a wave here. It's going to move into the Gulf of Mexico and there is a high probability or at least a 70% chance according to the hurricane center that this becomes a tropical depression. I think anything that develops will likely stay fairly weak and that the biggest issue we're going to have here is probably going to be rainfall. I think the bigger questions are where is that rainfall going to occur and what exactly is the track of this system? So those are the questions. Does it organize? If it organizes a little bit more, it tends to consolidate the rain and that may keep the rain away from us. So that's question number one. Uh, number two is uh, where does it uh, where does it track? Where does it go? If it takes more of an easterly route along the Texas coast, the heavier rain will be around Houston. And that's what some of the models are starting to hint at. We would still get some rain out of it, but maybe not the heavy stuff. And we could be on the dry side or at least the drier side of things, again, depending on how it moves. But if it goes a little bit further inland, there is a chance we could see some heavy rain out of this. It's more of a wait and see kind of scenario. We got to wait till this gets into the Gulf of Mexico to get a little bit better idea. Here's what I'm thinking, though. Warm temperatures next couple days, 20 percent chance of rain Sunday. And then Monday, we're going to go with a 40 percent chance scattered downpours. We'll taper that off just a little bit Tuesday and Wednesday as I think a lot of that moisture gets pushed out to the east. Temperatures stay in the low 90s next week. Stay tuned over the weekend. Katie and Sarah will have the uh, absolute latest on what's going on there in the Gulf, guys. Looks like a lot could change. Thank you. Yep. We've been touting this all summer and all through the fall as the season starts. We have a new teammate, and then they are really helping us out when it comes to covering high school football. Yeah, Texas Sports Productions. A lot of times our photogs only are there for the first quarter. Mm -hmm. They get a touchdown or two and leave. So sometimes we don't get a comeback touchdown in the fourth quarter. Well, case in point, TSP helped us last night big time when it comes to Stevens and Marshall. We got that coming up. Plus, Brandeis Volleyball is ready for a key match tonight. Coming up next. In big game coverage last night, Stevens almost toppled the undefeated Marshall Rams. This was a great game. Third quarter, Landon Prouty scores from seven yards out, and the Falcons lead the Rams 20 to nine. Two point conversion was no good. Prouty rushed for 158 yards. The Rams come back with two touchdowns in the fourth quarter. First, we have Jack Kaliski on the QB keeper. Five yard touchdown run. Then V Katashi scores a two yarder with three minutes left in the game, and the Rams come back 23 20, improving to 3 0. UTSA Roadrunners are ready for their home opener in the Alamo Dome after opening the season on the road where they won at Illinois 37 30. Senior Spencer Burford and Wagner alum was asked how does experience help in trying to keep the team focused following a big win like that? That's where seniority comes in. Um, you're not a big brother, a little brother type deal, but at the same time, um, you gotta you gotta lead them in the right way. Of course, they're young-minded, so therefore you want the older guys to be able to be there as a supporting factor, just to show them that this is what it is and it's not what it's not. You know what I'm saying? That's where leadership comes in. That's where our guys play a great part in doing, make sure that we stay focused and stay on the and on the goal. Kickoff in the Alamo Dome is 5 p.m. tomorrow. Turning to girls high school volleyball, the Brandeis Broncos are once again one of the top teams in the area. They're 27 and 2 overall and 2 and 1 in District 28-6A. They beat Churchill 3 nothing Tuesday night. The Broncos are led by best friends and TCU volleyball commits Carly Ferris and Jalen Gibson. They make up two of the 10 seniors on the roster. That's a lot of experience. Being a senior leader is cool, but can also be bittersweet. Honestly, I'm really excited. I do get sad sometimes because it is it is almost over, but I'm ready for the next level, so I'm just taking everything in. Your mindset changes as a senior. You come in every day and you're like, we are not messing around today. We're going to get better. We're going to work harder. And not that it wasn't like that before, but it's like, this is my senior year and we're not going to play any games. Like We're going to get stuff done and we have a goal. And our goal is to be in state in November. And so we definitely just have that mindset this year, especially as a senior. Brandeis will face the Reagan Rattlers in a huge District 28-6A showdown. Reagan is 28-5 overall and first in District at 4-0. This is definitely going to be an entertaining match. It's definitely going to be a good game. It's going to be a lot of good volleyball on both sides, and we are going to work 
every single day to get better for the things we need to do. And we're going to focus on our specific weak spots that we need to work on to be able to push through and hopefully take the game. I'm really excited, honestly. Our team, we're preparing for it right now. Uh, we're really excited, ready to see what happens, so yeah. Reagan's a great team, they're very young, so we're gonna have to go ahead and execute how we know to and um, not play a mental game, but really get after it and take care of business. Brandeis and Reagan will play tonight, 5.30 at Littleton Gym. It's the first meeting between the two sides since last year's Class 6A Regional Final, which Reagan won in four sets. Why'd you have to show them running those suicides? Man? <laughs> well, that's what they were doing, we were there. <laughs> Yeah, it makes me, you know, makes us tired. <laughs> He's back. still tired from walking to his truck this yeah. morning. To All drive, 10 seconds drive of it or whatever I heard, yeah. right? 10 steps. 10 steps, okay. <sighs> 8,000 to go. <laughs> Some of my favorite people uh -huh. are on SA Live today. Mike and Fiona? <laughs> yes. Mike and <laughs> Not us, sorry. Mike and well, Jen. Yes. You're about us, right? <laughs> but a couple others because something that you're going to be doing tomorrow night, Fiona, and we have a couple of fi or, uh, Ursula. Ursula, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got a couple of big celebrities with us today. Yes, Justin Osmond, nephew to Donny Emery, and hey. Emma Thayrick. And always a pleasure to have you with thank the Aid the Silent Gala tomorrow, but you've done so much for the community. Ah, uh, thank you. It's been such a joy. It's been six years of being in the organization. Uh -huh. And you're hoping to raise one more clinic or one more yes, clinic tomorrow night? Yes, the goal is to raise a million dollars worth of hearing aid since I distance and we're only one traveling hearing aid clinic away from that goal. So we need your help tomorrow night at the Witty. And we're going to hear more about that coming up in just a couple of minutes. All right. It's hot, it's hard <laughs> to exercise outside. Why not bring the exercise inside, especially for your pup? And we have got Zoomy, something really yes, interesting here. The, Doggy Fitness. Yes, they bring, Zoomy Fitness brings the treadmills to your place and gets your, gets your dog tired, especially if they have a lot of energy. So we'll talk more about that. Look at how cute. And while the dog is exercising, <laughs> then you can eat some really, really great food. And our good friend, Jose Benitez, is here. And uh, we're gonna be making, this is great food. Thank you, appreciate that.